This video is not monetized. Just consider it a public safety announcement, especially for anyone in the Evansville, Indiana area. You're going to want to know about this guy. So I received this comment from Jade Autumn to look into a case of a Thomas Shiro, a little known case with very little coverage. Even YouTubing his name gets you the soccer player instead. But with the few articles I did find, sourced in the description below, this guy is probably one of the worst human beings that most of us has never heard of. And as I dove deeper, the more important it felt to get this story out to the public because this monster I'm going to talk about might be walking the streets again very soon. So if you ever share a video, share this one. Because there's something wrong with the balance of justice in this case. And maybe we could tip the scales a bit to keep a murdering rapist in prison. And one last thing before we start the case. Jade Autumn also emailed me several letters written by Thomas Shiro himself to his fiancée in 1981, which we will be dissecting in a future video. So if you want to see what a gaslighting sociopath writes like, hit that subscribe. On February 5th, 1981, Laura Lubihosen answers a knock at her door to find a man she's never seen before asking for help. The man, Thomas Shiro, said that he was having car trouble and he just needed to use her phone to call a friend. Laura, whose roommate was away at the time, was home alone and against her better judgment, felt like helping this stranger in need and almost immediately regretted her decision once this man was in her house. Thomas Shiro is an extremely troubled 21-year-old. Living at a halfway house after serving three years for robbery, he was a drug addict and a violent alcoholic. The day he knocked on Laura's door, he was high on quaaludes and had less than good intentions for the 29-year-old woman. And disturbingly, this wasn't something that was new to him. Once Thomas was inside Laura's home, instead of asking where the phone was, he first asked where the bathroom was, and when he was done, he came out with his pants still down, exposing himself to Laura. Seeing the horror on her face, he immediately explains this behavior as being okay because he was gay, as if that made perfect sense. Laura tells him politely to pull his pants back up and explains that it makes her uncomfortable because she was molested as a child and either way, she wasn't interested because she was a lesbian. Thomas figured it was time to put the small talk aside and attacked Laura. For the next few hours, he would restrain and rape her repeatedly, forced her to take drugs and drink alcohol with him. When he ran out of liquor, he took her with him to buy some more, brought her back home, restrained her again, and continued. Thomas would eventually fall asleep, and Laura, still awake from the hell she just endured, quietly lifted herself off the bed, arms still restrained, and headed towards the door. Unfortunately, she wasn't quiet enough. Thomas jumped out of bed, grabbed her, threw her back down, and raped her again. Once the cloud of drugs and alcohol cleared his brain a bit, he came to the conclusion that he couldn't let her live. He picked up a bottle of vodka and began hitting Laura's head with it until the bottle shattered. He then grabs an iron and continued his onslaught, eventually resorting to strangling her with the cord. He dragged her lifeless body to another room with the idea of getting rid of her. But then he was aroused again at the sight of her corpse. And I don't need to explain what he did then. But afterwards, he simply left her body there, straightened up the house a bit, even though there was clearly a struggle with blood everywhere. He found the keys to her car and proceeded to steal that as well. Laura's roommate, Darlene Hooper, would come home to a house in disarray. Soon she would be unnerved to see the blood on the walls and the floor, and then pure horror when she found Laura's semi-clothed body. The autopsy report comes back with numerous contusions to the body, including injuries to the head. There was a laceration to one nipple and thigh, a tear in the vagina, all caused 
after death. There was also a human bite mark on her thigh. The main cause of death was strangulation. Detectives were on the move, and the first line of action was to find Laura's stolen car. Now any half-witted criminal would abandon the car far away and find another means to get home. But our man Thomas Shiro drove and parked the car right near the halfway house he was staying at. For anyone who doesn't know what a halfway house is, just like I didn't. It's a center for former drug addicts, prisoners, etc. In short, a place to adjust and blend back into general society. So yeah, he parked the stolen car of the woman he just murdered where he was living, where the police would easily find it. But to make things even easier, Thomas also confessed this murder to his counselor and to his girlfriend at the time. And that's how we know the details of what happened to Laura. Once he was arrested and awaiting his trial, he even bragged to a fellow inmate. He clearly was a man that did himself zero favors. And it's no wonder when at trial, his defense lawyer, without any legs to stand on, made this statement to the jury. Was there a killing? Sure, no doubt about it. Did Tom Shiro do it? Sure, there's no question about it. I'm not gonna try and bamboozle this jury. There was a killing, and he did it. It took just five hours for the jury to convict Thomas Shiro for the rape and murder of Laura Lubihausen. And I always hate to tell you guys when a sentence truly does not fit the crime. Though it did sound great at first because the jury wanted life plus the death penalty. But by the mysteries of the state of Indiana, his death sentence was later overturned and he was set to be released as soon as 2007, which was just 23 years for rape and murder. Now, I don't even know how to begin to describe this next part because is it a feel-good story of a police force coming together to make sure the bad guy stays in jail or an aggravating tale of police politics and incompetence you be the judge so back when thomas shiro was convicted of laura's murder he was also the prime suspect in two other rape cases in which the victims came forward identified him from seeing him in the news and were ready to bring it to trial but, since Shiro was given the death penalty, the police department decided not to pursue it any further. So when Shiro's death penalty got vacated in 1996 and his release date began to loom near, Indiana detectives swung into action, getting in contact with the two past victims and finally bringing it to trial over two decades later. One of the victims now was already 70 years old and now has to relive the worst days of her life all over again. In 2006, just a year shy of Shiro being released, he was convicted of the two rapes and is still rotting in jail as I write this story in 2022, according to the Indiana Department of Corrections website. But I have more shitty news for you. As you can see here, he is projected to be released as soon as January 7th of 2023. That's just three months away. He'll be just 63 years old. So why is this such a far cry from the initial life plus death? Laura isn't breathing anymore. His rape victims are scarred for life. Would it be too much to ask for the punishment to fit the crime? 